So, welcome to uh, today's lecture on uh, multi-phase flows. What we'll do today is uh, look at another problem uh, in fluid mechanics, and uh, the idea is that this particular problem will be different from the earlier problem of natural convection in the sense that the earlier problem we only had one phase. Okay, and uh, although towards the end we will discuss the problem of this hypothetical problem of the liquid with the uh, being surrounded by gas, we did not allow the interface to deform, the interface was remaining flat. Today what we will do is we will look at a problem where we will allow the interface to deform okay. and uh, what that means is uh, you would have to use uh, things like the kinematic boundary condition which we derived. Uh, a few lectures back and also uh, the other boundary conditions, the normal stress boundary condition. So, that in that sense this problem is uh, one level more complicated because we are going to consider a truly multi-phase flow problem with two liquids and an interface which is actually deforming. Okay? And uh, the idea is that uh, we would make assumptions again to try and get an analytical uh, insight into the problem. This problem is called the Rayleigh-Taylor problem okay. and uh, this is essentially uh, an instability which is going to be driven by a density stratification. So, for example, so if when you have a density stratification and a heavy liquid on top of a lighter liquid is inherently unstable you all know that if you have two liquid layers and these are immiscible liquids okay immiscible so you can think in terms of water which is usually denser than most of the other uh, liquids lying on top of another organic solvent okay so, this is inherently unstable and what is going to happen is the water will have a tendency to come into the uh, phase which is below and then the uh, oil phase is likely to rise up. So, this is and if it had been the other way if the lighter liquid is on top it is going to stay as it is okay. So, what this means is the instability is going to be driven primarily by the density differences and that is something which we have to make sure we include in the model okay. So, basically what I am saying is density differences drive the instability and this has to be retained, this has to be included the model okay. So, this is the geometry that we are going to be looking at uh, this is liquid 1 which has density rho 1 and viscosity mu 1 this is liquid 2 which has density rho 2 viscosity mu 2 and we have a situation where this liquid is just lying on top of the other. I mean you have been very carefully you added this uh, other liquid and then uh, these two liquids are having this uh, uh, flat interface. What we want to do is we want to ask the question if I were to disturb this interface how exactly is the system going to behave okay. And x, y and z. 
as my coordinate axis, z is the vertical direction. And to keep life simple, what we will do is uh, we do not want to have to worry about all these boundary conditions. So, we are going to assume that the liquids are going to extend to infinity in all directions in the x direction, in the y direction and the z direction. Okay? So, the liquids extend to infinity in the x, y and z directions. Okay. And uh, what I want you to uh, keep in mind as we work out this problem is the close analogy similarities with what we did for the Rayleigh uh, Bernard problem, the natural convection problem because I think that is basically what you are going to be doing whenever you are solving a problem. Okay. So, the analysis procedure is the same only thing is now uh, we have to worry about the uh, this thing uh, interface de deflection. So, the additional feature. feature here is we allow the interface to deform okay and which we did not do in the earlier problem. So, what that means is we need to use the kinematic boundary condition. Okay. For instance, so that is the uh, level of complexity. What we will do is um, we want to consider as usual a base state and then give a perturbation around the base state. Right? I mean we want to, so what is going to be the base state? The base state is going to be one where everything is at rest, this liquid is at rest and that liquid is at rest. So, that means all the velocity components are 0. Okay? So, the base state is that of a static fluid. I mean both the phases are static which means I am going to say u 1 s s equals v 1 s s equals w 1 s s equals 0, subscript 1 tells me this, this liquid, subscript 2 tells me it corresponds to the velocities of the second liquid. Okay? And similarly, that means that is the state I have, one liquid resting on top of the other completely stationary. Okay? And uh, what we want to do is we ask the question is this stable or unstable. Of course, you already know the answer in the sense that if the guy is denser at the top, you want it to be, uh, you expect it to be unstable. Okay? But then we want to go through the calculation and ask the, see how exactly is this instability going to manifest or is there a condition which comes because in addition to the density difference, there is also going to be a surface tension of. Uh, this interface and this interface which we need to look at. So, does this have a stabilizing influence? So, we are going to look at the influence of the uh, surface tension, the density difference and uh, yeah, maybe even the viscosity, but to begin with we are going to assume that the viscosity is not really going to play an important role because viscosity is a friction and what you are focusing on is an instability which is driven by what is happening at the interface. So, what is more important is for you to include the surface tension effect. So, to begin with what we will do is we will assume that the two liquids are inviscid because what viscosity will do is only going to slow down things. So, viscosity is going to possibly change your growth rate of your disturbance and it is going to modify the growth rate. It is not going to really change whether it is going to be positive or negative, okay? but that we will see. So, uh, we will uh, the base state, how do you find the base state? We found the velocity being stationary, but we need to get the pressure gradient. Okay? So, if you were to simplify the equation of motion, equation of motion in the x direction, Okay, what do you have? 
rho du by dt equals minus dp by dx plus mu del square u. Okay. Since the velocity is 0, this reduces to dp by dx being 0. Okay. At uss equals 0, we get dpss by dx equals 0, which means pss is a function of y and z only because there is no change in the x direction. Okay. If you look at the y component, similarly in the y direction, we get dpss by dy equals 0. Okay, because the gravitational field is in the z direction. And what does this imply? This implies that PSS is a function only of z. Okay, so in the base state, you are, and that is perfectly understandable because you only have the pressure gradient in the vertical direction. In the horizontal direction, there is no pressure gradient. Okay, that is what you conclude from these equations of motion. And as far as z direction is concerned, what do we get? We would get 0 equals minus dp1 ss by dz plus z I am showing it going upwards. Okay. So, the gravitational field is in the negative z direction minus rho 1 g. This is for the first liquid, okay, and that means the first liquid is uh, extending from minus infinity less than z less than zero. Whereas in the second liquid, I have which extends from okay. So, this is clearly the hydrostatic pressure gradient, which is what uh, everybody understands. So, all I am going to do is I am going to integrate this out and I am going to get that pressure is going to vary linearly with z. So, from uh, the first equation, what do I get? P1 ss equals minus rho 1 g z plus a constant c 1 okay, p 2 s s equals minus rho 2 g z plus a constant c 2. Okay. So, that is basically what I get and uh, you know that the pressure as you go up has to decrease and that is what is happening is becoming as z increases is becoming more and more negative. Now, we have to determine these constants c 1 and c 2 okay. and for that what we need to do is uh, have some kind of a boundary condition. So, we are going to take we take at z equals 0, p 1 equals p 2, of course, at the interface p 1 the pressure will be equal, p 1 equals p 2 equals 0. Now, what is the motivation for this? Of course, you can take it to be any arbitrary constant. Okay. The idea is that flows are going to be driven by pressure differences. Okay. So, it is not the actual value of the pressure which actually is going to drive the flow. Even you have a pipe flow, if you have an inlet pressure of 80 atmospheres, outlet pressure is 70 atmospheres, you are going to have a drop of 10 atmospheres 
okay and with an incompressible liquid you have a particular pressure gradient that is the flow. Suppose you had 50 atmospheres and 40 atmospheres you again have the same pressure gradient the flow is going to be the same because the pressure gradient is what is important the absolute value of the pressure does not matter. So, the idea is that you can choose one of these pressure points as a reference point and you can calculate what the other value is okay. So, th that is basically what we are doing here we are just choosing at z equal to 0 the reference value of the pressure to be 0 okay and with keeping this as the reference value we are going to find the relative value of the pressure at the other points and then see what is going to happen. So, this you can just say is a reference value okay and uh, this is permissible since pressure gradients drive the flow and the actual pressure does not matter okay. So, with this uh, simplification at z equal to 0 pressure is 0 what do I get I get basically c 1 and c 2 will be 0 okay this yields p 1 equals minus rho 1 g z and p 2 equals minus rho 2 g z okay. Now that we found the steady state, the steady state is characterized by the velocity and the pressure and we found that. We need to now find out if it is stable. So, what do we do to find out if it, the stability of the state? We have to give this perturbation right. So, we write the actual variables. So, okay. what I am going to do is I am going to make one more assumption here. We will assume the two liquids. are inviscid. So, the way I would uh, you know justify this is I like to make this assumption and see what the analysis yields. If I am not happy I will just go back and relax this assumption include the effect of viscosity and go through with the analysis okay. So, that is what you should be doing whenever you do any problem I mean you start with a simple problem and then see if the, you are getting any insight if you are not getting any insight you made too much of a simplification you add a le level of complexity and then you keep on building. It would have been stupid for me to assume that the two densities are equal and keep the differences in the viscosity because what I am expecting to drive the flow is the density difference. So, I am going to retain the density difference, but just to make sure that the algebra becomes easier and I am going to neglect the effect of viscosity okay. So, this basically is going to simplify it mathematically. Okay. And then I do my calculation I get some result at the end of the day if the result is uh, anywhere close to the uh, actual problem then I say fine I mean uh, maybe this assumption was not very bad after all maybe the effect of viscosity is not important okay. But if it turns out to be uh, you know different from what I actually see in an experiment then I come back and say well maybe this is the problem maybe I assume this thing to be inviscid and actually the viscosity uh, effect is important and I have to include it okay. That is the only way to go about doing it okay. So, right now uh, my motivation is I do not want a second order equation. So, I just uh, want to just uh, keep it uh, simple and so that is the motivation and let us see if I can get away with it okay or get some insight at least into the problem. So, uh, this simplifies the mathematics okay and uh, if the predictions are close to the uh, experiment then 
we can possibly justify the assumption okay and of course if it just because it's close to the experiment doesn't mean it's right i mean maybe you just got lucky okay so i mean you have to be careful uh, if they're not matching then you know for sure something is wrong if it's matching you never know if you're right okay that's always a problem okay so let's not uh, let's just say that just because this is matching the experiment everything is perfect everything is likely to be perfect not necessarily perfect okay so now uh, what do we do uh, we find the st um, stability by giving a perturbation same step find a steady state find do a, give a perturbation find the linearized equations and solve that's what we did last time we're going to do the, that's what we've been doing for the last three four classes okay so what is the purpose of this thing u1 the actual variable is written in terms of u1 ss plus epsilon u1 tilde similarly for everything now remember once uh, denotes the fluid first fluid or the second fluid similarly for all the variables okay um, similarly for all variables and uh, so is p1 tilde and uh, u2 equals u2 ss plus epsilon u2 tilde and so on okay and just to tell you that these things are infinite symbol i put that epsilon in front of it so what do we do now we substitute all this in my governing equations because the governing equations are going to be valid for u1 v1 u2 v2 okay the actual variable i'm going to go back to my equation of continuity and write whatever u is there as u ss plus epsilon u tilde okay and we have to do this for all the equations so the equation of continuity implies d by dx of u plus d by dy of v plus d by dz of w equal to 0 this is for the first fluid and uh, I'm going to substitute u1 ss u1 as u1 ss plus epsilon u1 tilde and this means and u1 ss is 0 so when I substitute this back inside here at order epsilon what do I get du1 tilde by dx equals 0 okay now we go to the equation of um, momentum in the x direction the navier stokes equation in the x direction what is that that is rho 1 du 1 by dt plus u 1 du 1 by dx plus Y the X of maybe I should just write this as P one. Let me just write this as P one and then I will substitute this thing here. This is the actual this is in terms of the actual variables I have not done any perturbation now I am going to substitute for all the u1s u1 ss plus epsilon u1 okay so what do I know this is going to become rho 1 u1 ss of course is 0 so I get u1 tilde by dt 
multiplied by epsilon because u1 is u1 ss plus epsilon u1 tilde so u1 ss is 0 so u1 is epsilon u1 tilde okay so i have epsilon u1 tilde here and what about this guy this is going to give me epsilon u1 tilde times the derivative of epsilon u1 tilde which means this is epsilon squared okay so this is a second order term and this is not going to contribute this is not going to contribute because it's a second order term this guy is not going to contribute again for the same reason all i'm saying is this is epsilon squared u1 tilde du1 tilde by dx plus epsilon squared v1 tilde du1 tilde by dy plus epsilon squared w1 tilde du1 tilde by dz okay and all these guys just go off because they are of higher order okay and what does this become minus d by dx of p1 ss plus epsilon p1 tilde we know that dp1 ss by dx is 0 okay so that's the, it's not the p1 ss is 0 it's that the derivative is 0 and therefore this reduces to at order epsilon i get rho 1 du1 tilde by dt equals minus dp1 tilde by dx okay now you can do the same analysis in the y direction so let me just uh, write that thing down neatly a bit let me um, write those two equations neatly because I want to preserve this so that uh, I don't make any mistakes. This is just the equation of continuity, okay? Which I already derived, and then the other one is x. If you did the thing in the y direction. Either you're going to agree with me, or you ha if you don't agree with me, you have to work out the problem and uh, you know decide you don't agree with me. You get a similar equation. In the y direction, you would get rho one dv one tilde by dt equals minus dp one tilde by dy. Everything is going to be the same. Okay, you will get second. The inner the uh, convective terms are going to give you a second order term, so that's not going to contribute. These guys are going to contribute at order epsilon. And uh, in the z direction, you only have one small complication in the sense that you have the gravity term coming, okay. But then the gravity term, remember, I will just explain that, and this is similar to the energy balance we had for the Rayleigh Binet problem. In the z direction, you will have rho 1 dw1 tilde by dt plus the order of epsilon square terms, which we do not worry about will be minus dp by dz of p1 ss plus epsilon p1 tilde minus rho 1 g and at steady state dp1 ss by dz is equal to minus rho 1 g okay so this is going to balance off that guy and so that goes off okay I did not write the gravity term in the x and y direction because the gravity does not exist in the x and y direction. Here the gravity does exist, but this gravity is going to balance my dp1 ss by dz because dp1 ss by dz, remember, was equal to minus rho 1 g. So this again simplifies to minus. So this again, so basically this and this are 0 from my steady state and together okay it is not that rho and g is 0 is that together they are 0 and I get the same equation for w1 tilde also. The point I am trying to make here is you guys have to sit down and make sure you do each and every term uh, properly and then do the calculation okay and I did not want to you know just say you get the same equation because there is a small subtle point here. Um, This is all for the one phase. 
you will have similar equations for the other phase. Okay? You have same equations for the other phase. So basically these are your equations which are going to uh, tell you how the perturbations and the pressure are basically related to each other. Okay? We have similar equations in phase 2. Now, um, in the really bad problem, in fact, if you remember, I tried to uh, write the expansion first, right, to convert it to the partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations and then uh, reduce the number of dependent variables. Okay? And then we found that we got stuck because I had assumed a sin alpha x dependency and then the two velocity components were actually out of phase sin and cosine and then you had a problem. So we, I really couldn't proceed. And then somebody said we should use uh, e power i alpha x as a um, way out. So that's what we'll do now. So that that what we did was we reduced the number of dependent variables first, u v w uh, p, and then we converted it to ODs. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the expansion in terms of the independent variables first, and then. Uh, you know, do the elimination of the, this thing. So what we'll do is we're going to uh, seek the solution. So both are actually equivalent. We will seek the solutions as u1 tilde. Remember, what is u1 tilde? A function of x, y, z, and t. Okay. We're going to seek this as u1 star of what variable? I need to impose the boundary conditions in the z direction. What boundary condition? The one at the interface. Some uh, continuity of velocity, whatever it is. Okay? So I need to have that direction to be determined using the boundary condition. Okay? So that is the guy I am going to keep here. And in the other two directions, I have assumed them to be spanning to infinity in the x and y directions. Okay, so I'm going to assume look for periodic solutions there, but instead of looking for things in the form of sine and cosine, I'm going to look for things as e power i alpha subscript x x multiplied by e power i alpha subscript y y, and the time dependency is of the form e power sigma t. Okay, so because these equations are linear, I'm assuming that uh, this is the form of the uh, disturbance. Our objective again is to find, get this relationship between the growth rate and the wave number. Because that was the thing we finally got even in the Rayleigh Binet problem, sigma versus alpha or Rayleigh number versus uh, this thing. So what does alpha x represent? It represents some kind of a spatial frequency in the x direction. Alpha y represents the spatial frequency in the uh, uh, y direction. Alpha x is in the x direction, alpha y is in the y direction. Okay, and that's my growth rate here, sigma. Um, so this is exactly what we did last time, but the point is, instead of using sine and cosine, I'm I'm just using the general form of the uh, Fourier transform, not a Fourier sine transform, not a Fourier cosine transform. What I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this in, and I, I'm going to make the same thing for all the variables. Okay, u1, v1, w1, u2, v2, w2. So all variables. follow this form. Okay, so I'm here I know all the uh, 8 variables, I'm just leaving it as it is. So now what we need to do is substitute and get ordinary differential equations for u1, v1, p1 star. Okay? And the uh, way we do it is substitute it in the equation of continuity. When you substitute this in the equation of continuity, I will get the derivative of u1 with respect to x. The derivative of u1 with respect to x is i alpha x multiplied by the entire thing. Okay? So this is going to give me from the equation of continuity, I get i alpha x times u1 star times 
e bar i alpha x x plus alpha y y plus sigma t. Okay. Then the dw by d, uh, dv by dz is going. To, when I have v, I have v1 star. Okay. Uh, sorry, dv1 by dy. I have v1 star of z, of course. And when I differentiate with respect to y, I get i alpha y. So Okay. And when I differentiate with respect to z for w1, I would get dw1 star by dz times e power i sigma t equals 0. Now, clearly, the uh, problem which I had last time of sine and cosine coming in is not that. I have the exponential term everywhere. Derivative of the exponential gives me the exponential. That means this is clearly non-zero and I can knock this thing off and what I have is i alpha x u1 star plus i alpha y v1 star plus dw1 star by dz equals 0. Okay. I want to come back and do the same thing for these three equations. I want to basically I, now what uh, my job is to uh, get this ordinary differential equation and uh, use the boundary conditions and find out uh, what the uh, stability condition is going to be. Okay. So wh what we're going to do now is just substitute the the form for u1 here, what do I get? Rho1, when I de uh, derivative this, uh, differentiate that with respect to time, I'm going to get a sigma multiplied by um, u1 star, etc., etc. Okay. So I'm using this condition now, uh, some equation number, maybe this is equation number 2. Okay. This is equation number 1. So this is from equation of continuity, which is 1, and from 2, what do I get? Rho1. Differential with respect to time, I get sigma multiplied by e power sigma t times plus i alpha x x plus alpha y y times u1 star of z, okay, equals minus dp1 by dx tilde. That's going to be pressure is also going to be of the same form. Okay. When I differentiate that, I get minus of i alpha x times p1 star times e power sigma t plus Again, the fact that such a form is admissible is coming because of the fact that this particular term is common for both and what this gives me is that rho 1 sigma u1 star equals minus i alpha x p1 star. Okay? That is what this is. So we can what we can do is we can uh, extend the same argument to the third equation here and uh, what we will get from 3, when I differentiate with respect to v1, I will get a rho 1 v1 star sigma and when I differentiate with respect to y, I will get minus i alpha y times p1 star. Okay. That is the uh, equation which I get from the this thing. And what about f the from 4? 
which I have not yet written over there, but that is going to be equation number 4. This, this guy is equation number 4, okay. When I differentiate with respect to time, I get rho 1 w 1 star sigma equals, now I am differentiating with respect to z. So, I get minus dp 1 star by dz. because exponential terms do not have z, it is the p1 star which is unknown which is a function of z, so I have that here. So now I am going to, I ha, now what I have done is I have converted it to an ordinary differential equation in z, but I still have 4 variables, the u, v, w and the pressure with the subscript 1 and the star, okay. And uh, what I am going to do is, I am going to uh, eliminate, okay. What I, uh, we can do is we have to eliminate, let us say the u and the v component of velocity, okay. And one way for you to do this elimination of the u and the v component of velocity is, we can uh, write from this what is u1 star and from this what is v1 star in terms of pressure. Okay. I can find u1 star, v1 star from these equations, substitute it in my equation of continuity, then I will be getting rid of u and v, get everything in terms of pressure and w. So, I have one equation in terms of uh, pressure and w, I have another equation in terms of pressure and w and I can go back and eliminate pressure again maybe and get only an equation in w1. Okay, so that is the basic steps that I am going to follow and so what do I, what do I get? u1 star equals from this equation here minus i alpha x p1 star divided by rho1 sigma, okay. v1 star is minus i alpha y p1 star divided by rho 1 sigma, that is what I found from these two equations. Now for u1 star and v1 star, I am going to substitute in this equation, okay. So I have i alpha x multiplied by u1 star, which is again an i alpha x with a negative sign minus i alpha x whole squared rho 1 sigma minus i alpha y the whole squared sigma plus d w 1 star by d z. Okay. So, equals 0, I hope uh, that is fine. All I have done is uh, doing a little bit of algebra here and this is going to be minus i squared, so that is going to be plus 1, so I get alpha x squared, I am going to take the rho 1 sigma along with my dw1 by dz, okay. So, I get minus alpha x squared or is it plus, it is plus alpha x squared plus alpha y squared times p1 star plus rho 1 sigma dw1 star by dz equals 0. So, this is the equation which relates pressure and w1, okay. I have also another equation which relates pressure and w1 right here and um, what I am going to do is I like to keep my velocity because I like to have my conditions on my velocity, my kinematic boundary conditions. So, rather than eliminate uh, velocity, I am going to eliminate pressure. I eliminate pressure by differentiating this with respect to pressure. I will get dp1 by dz, second derivative and I will substitute for dp1 by dz from this equation, okay. So, that is what we are going to do to differentiate that the last equation with respect to z and I get alpha x squared plus alpha y squared times dp1 star by dz plus 
rho 1 sigma dw1 star by dz equals 0, correct? Yeah. And you know dp1 star by dz is minus of rho 1 w1 star sigma. So this gives me minus of zero. So clearly rho and sigma cancels off and what I have is d squared w1 star by dz squared minus alpha squared w1 star equal to 0. Okay, what is alpha squared? Squared is alpha x squared plus alpha y squared. So this again is to tell you, see when we did the really bad problem, I assumed that things were actually two dimensional, that there was, the, we had roles, we did not have any pattern in the other direction, in this uh, one of the directions along which the axis of the roll was extending. So even if I had not made that assumption, I would have gotten two wave numbers like this and finally I would have gotten a composite wave number alpha, okay. So it really de does not matter because that is only a mathematical complexity, it is not a physical complexity. See what we want to do is make sure we retain the right physics in the problem. So this is my equation for the one phase. If you did the same thing again for the other phase, you would get similarly we get d squared w2 w two star and d is the squared minus alpha squared w2 star equals 0, okay. That is for the other phase. One represents the one phase, two represents the other phase. But we know the solutions to this equation, alpha is a constant, right? This is a linear equation with constant coefficient, second order. Everybody knows how to solve this problem. What is the solution? W1 star is A e power alpha z plus B e power minus alpha z. That is the solution to the differential equation. W2 star C e power alpha z plus D e power minus alpha z. Now our job is to find the constants A, B, C and D and for this we need boundary conditions, okay. So what are the boundary conditions we are going to have? Remember this first liquid is extending from 0 to infinity to minus infinity. Clearly what we expect is when there is some kind of instability at the interface, we expect that far away as z goes to minus infinity in the first fluid, as z goes to plus infinity in the other fluid, the velocity components are going to go to 0, okay. So basically you expect the velocity far away from the interface to be finite and bounded, it cannot become infinite. So that is going to help us determine two of these constants. For example, as z w2 is from 0 to infinity, so as z goes to infinity, I want the velocity to be bounded which means this guy should be present because this is the minus sign and this will go to 0, this has to be absent. So that tells me c has to be 0 here, okay. Similarly, um, in the other fluid, in the lower fluid, we will have z is going minus infinity should be present, okay. This will be present and this will be absent, something like that. So is not that right? Oh, that is right, is not it? I thought I said the same thing twice. So that is, that basically helps you determine two of the constants. We need to determine the other two constants and that is where the boundary conditions at the interface come in and that is where we are going to use the kinematic boundary condition and the one more condition. So the other condition which we are going to use is the normal stress boundary condition. This normal stress boundary condition is going to be preferred over the tangential stress boundary condition. The reason for that is that we made this thing invisible. See there are two conditions which have to be satisfied at the interface, both the normal stress boundary condition as well as the tangential stress boundary condition. How is it that uh, we do not need both, we need only one? The reason is we have assumed that the fluid is invisible. So we 
actually had a second order problem, but because I have assumed it to be inviscid, uh, my problem from second order has become first order. So I need to let go of one of the boundary conditions. The boundary condition which I am going to let go of is the tangential stress boundary condition because there is no continuity of tangential stress because normal stress is going to be present even in the absence of viscosity. So I retain the normal stress boundary condition, I let go of the tangential stress boundary condition. What we will do is we will use those conditions, get these constants and get the distribution curve tomorrow. <laughs>